Hello from Malta. I'm setting off from the beautiful city of Valletta to visit a truly ancient site, the Stone Age megalithic temples of Tarshin. Malta is an exceptionally mysterious place. On a small archipelago in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea are scattered monumental structures made of megalithic stone blocks, among them some of the oldest buildings in the world. At a time when the Sumerians didn't know writing and the Egyptians didn't know mud bricks, gigantic stone temples were erected in Malta. Some of them have survived to this day. Let's explore them together. Let's go! The megalithic structures of Malta were built over a span of one and a half thousand years, during the phase called by historians the Temple Period. It was the time of the transition from the Neolithic to the Bronze Age, starting from the 4th millennium BC to the so-called Tarshin phase, approximately three to two and a half thousand years BC. However, most researchers date the beginning of the construction of Tarshin temples to around the 32nd century BC, so to the times of the Nakada III culture in Egypt, the so-called Dynasty Zero, the rule of Thinis kings, such as Crocodile, Ka or Scorpion, as well as the beginning of the construction of Stonehenge in England, or the development of Sumerian cuneiform writing, the late Uruk period. Compared to other cultures of that time, the Maltese builders seem to be very advanced. After all, monumental megalithic temples were built on the island hundreds of years before construction of this complex. The Tarshin temples remained hidden for thousands of years, up until 1914, when local farmers began to complain that while working their fields their plows were destroyed by large stone blocks. They were excavated by the Maltese archaeologist Sir Temi Zamit. He discovered four separate but interconnected temples, as well as many prehistoric artifacts that can be seen today in the local museum. Zamit also excavated other important archaeological sites, such as the underground house of Lieni Hypodium and the older temples of Hajarim and Minaidra, which I will show you in one of my next episodes. The current entrance gate is the result of a reconstruction from the 1950s, inspired by other Maltese temples with a typical triathlon doorway. However, we don't know the original appearance of the entrance. All these gigantic limestone blocks were probably transported using stone spheres, many of which were found around the temple. What the Tarshin complex is famous for is the largest and most beautiful collection of stone sculptures among all Maltese temples. In the abscess of the main temple we can admire abstract spiral patterns made with great precision. The creators of these beautiful decorations, probably not knowing copper tools yet, used stone ones. It's hard to believe it when you see the result of their work.
Small reliefs depicting goats, rams and pigs were also found. Perhaps a ritual slaughter of these animals took place here. Sadly, most of the carvings visible on site are faithful copies. The original ones were transferred to the National Museum of Archaeology in Valletta. If you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, please do it now. Just click the button in the bottom right corner. Thanks! Due to the characteristic female images found within the temples, it was quite commonly believed that these were places of worship of the Mother Goddess. The famous statue called the Fat Lady perhaps is the oldest monumental anthropomorphic representation known from Mediterranean prehistory. Figurines of a similar Corpulent mother goddess have been found in Europe, North Africa and the Middle East, sometimes dating back as far as 25,000 years from the Paleolithic. The traces of this popular prehistoric mother goddess religion were looked for in Maltese Neolithic monuments and artifacts as in the closed culture of Malta isolated from the rest of the world this cult was to survive the longest. A popular theory in the past was that the society of prehistoric Malta was a matriarchy dominated by powerful priestesses of the Mother Goddess. However, this theory lacks scientific foundation. Figurines of corpulent people seem to be associated with funeral ceremonies, as here in Malta most of them have been discovered in necropolises. In front of us, probably the main altar of the southern temple. Burnt pieces of animal bones were found in the opening in the upper part of the altar, and in the lower, sealed part, archaeologists discovered stone knives perhaps used for ritual slaughter. Temples such as these did not only have a religious role, they could serve as cultural and political centers, as well as granaries. Their high walls symbolized the status and wealth of the local community, competing with other clans on the island. However, they were not of a defensive nature. Neolithic Malta was never one political entity, but a group of local communities, probably clans, gathered around their own temples. According to archaeologists, temples also served residential purposes. Priests could have lived here. By controlling the temple and all its functions, they must have had actual political power by being in charge of granaries and food redistribution. It is possible that the Neolithic communities of Malta were governed by priests. But we know for sure that temples were religious and economic centers for nearby regions. Their other functions remain a mystery, as the temple builders didn't use writing. There are many indications that the temples were originally roofed. The massive walls supported layers of stone sets stepped inwards, early examples of a corbelled roof. We don't know how high the temples were. In Malta, only sculptures depicting such domed temples have been preserved. The temples look austere and empty today, but thousands of years ago they were filled with holy figures, pedestals, pottery and wooden decorations.
carved holes were used to support wooden doors or other barriers, but some of the cavities arouse controversy. Especially these larger, shallower recesses, according to some researchers, could have been made for acoustic purposes, being a kind of prehistoric speakers. The Tarshin temples were analyzed from an archaeoacoustic point in 2016 by the Super Brain Research Group, an international group of archaeologists researching, among others, ancient buildings in terms of their physical properties, directly influencing the mind through the vibrations they produced. These archaeologists had previously worked on the Hypogeum in a nearby Pada, a slightly older and well-preserved underground sanctuary and necropolis that appears to have been designed specifically for acoustics, with resonant niches carved out to project chanting or drumming throughout the sanctuary. Sadly, I can't show you the Hypogeum. Filming is strictly prohibited there. Cameras and even smartphones must be left in the lockers before entering the site. According to scholars, in a hypogeum, in that large underground temple of the dead, corpses were simply stored, the remains were not separated, but in the presence of decomposing bodies, dark ceremonies of a mysterious death cult were participated in. Maltese temples were designed according to a specific pattern. The carved stone facade features a main entrance made of massive stone blocks, two uprights supporting a horizontal capstone. The main corridor opens on both sides to lobe-shaped apses. This arrangement resembles a clover. Apses often contained remarkably decorated altars. These are the replicas of jars discovered in 1915. To this day we don't know what they were used for. And another mystery. What was this hole in the floor for? Who was this little square passage cut into the wall for? Copper tools appeared in Malta only around the 2nd millennium BC, probably under the influence of a new migrating group of foreigners familiar with metallurgy. The isolated builders of Tarshin can therefore be classified as a still Neolithic culture. Let us remember that the Stone Age didn't end everywhere at the same time. For example, in Western Europe it lasted longer than in Malta, even hundreds of years after the construction of the Great Pyramid of Khufu. So these precisely crafted polygonal blocks must have been carved using stone tools. Incredible. And what really strikes me here, you see, is how the blocks are connected with each other. It's so accurate, it's so perfect. That's really astonishing. We are looking now at the remains of the oldest part of the temple, dating back to around 3600 BC. 
As you can see, it was made of much smaller stones. On the other hand, the latest Starshin construction is this impressive protective tent-like shelter, erected here only in 2015. A cemetery dating from the first phase of the Bronze Age was discovered on the temple grounds. Urns for cremated remains, copper tools and cult figurines, perhaps depicting the dead. The temple was therefore reused in later eras as a burial ground. Over time, with the arrival of the Bronze Age, the inhumation of remains in rock-cut tombs was replaced by cremation, which became a new common practice of burying the dead probably resulting from the influence of foreigners. But in a moment I'll show you a real cemetery from the Stone Age, hundreds of years older than the Tarshin complex. I will get inside those rarely visited and never filmed gems of Neolithic Malta, so stay with me. The so-called Upper Cemetery is located about 300 meters north of the beaches of St. Paul's Bay. The tombs were excavated by British archaeologist John Davis Evans in 1955, who dated them to approximately 3600 BC. Today we know that the tombs were used until the end of the temple period, that is, until the end of Tarshin phase. The entrances to the tombs are marked with small mounds of stones. The Neolithic cemetery of Shamshia consists of six rock-cut tombs. I managed to enter several of them. These are the oldest tombs I've ever been to. Although their location has always been known, they were not explored until the 1950s. They were probably previously considered to be just another Roman or Punic tombs, of which there are plenty in the area. I'll show them to you another time. I'm going in. Hoping I won't see any snakes. In addition to fragments of pottery and stone decorations, both human and domestic animal bones were found. The remains of the people buried here don't bear any traces of hard work in the fields or difficult living conditions, so perhaps we are looking at the tombs of the elite of that time. They were buried here in the fetal position. A straight body wouldn't fit here. Believe me, there's no room even for my camera. They're tight. The tombs are overgrown and spiders are literally everywhere. I do not advise entering them during the rainy season, as it's already difficult to move on the slippery clay ground. The layout of the tombs is alike. A narrow, round entrance leads to a small, rough-hewn, dome-shaped chamber. However, one of the tombs is different. It's larger. The chamber is expanded with five niches, which makes it somewhat similar to Maltese temples from the times when they were still roofed. This is certainly not a coincidence. In 
Interestingly, there are remains of skeletons from these tombs bear traces of posthumous disarticulation, the separation of the bones of the deceased, who were already in an advanced stage of decomposition. This was a characteristic custom in the late Neolithic period, and it was practiced until the construction of the temples in Tarshin, when funeral rites and the cult of the dead dominated the religion of prehistoric Malta. I am back to Valletta. It's time to prepare for a new journey. Next time I'll tell you more about mysterious inhabitants of prehistoric Malta. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, please subscribe to my channel, like my video, share it with your friends and leave a comment below. Special thanks to all my patrons. You are the best. Thank you so much. And see you on another ancient site.